Of course, I want to thank everybody for coming. And I want to thank Deborah for the Slow Flowers movement and for getting us a platform that we can all start to um, have these important conversations. So that we can learn about doing business better, both from like better designs, better growing, better sourcing, um, better mechanics, all these things. It's an exciting group to be a part of, and I'm glad that I'm here today. I am interested to know how many of you are farmers? Raise of hands. Okay. How many of you are florists? Okay, how many of you florists are shop florists? And then how many of you are event florists? Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about, my background is mainly as an event florist. I came from a background in, his, in history, not history, in horticulture, the other H word that people don't know. Um, so I came as a garden designer, maintainer person for 20 years or something, and then transitioned into floristry. And I really am pretty much a wedding specialist, so that's kind of my, that's where I come from. Um, and I want to impart some information for, to you, get you thinking about some things. I want you to ask questions. I want this presentation to be of service to you, right? Like, that's why I'm here. I'm here to share knowledge with you. So as I talk about stuff, if there are things that you want to know, if you have questions, just jump up and say so. And then there will also be um, time for questions at the end. And then I'm here all day. You can pick my brain. So anyway, I'm here today to talk about sustainable design. And so for me... Um, sustainable design, oh, I should get my notes out of my pocket. Um, sustainable design is a greater piece of sustainable floristry. And to me, the slow flowers movement is a big piece of sustainable floristry. And by that, I'm thinking like sourcing local, um, you know, working with local farmers. But I think it's much bigger than that also. It is... Um, it is how we hold our businesses as a whole. So all of the parts of our businesses. And then also it is the flowers we source, but it's also the rest of the stuff we use in our business, the things we use in installations, the vases we use, the paper that we do print out our proposals on or choose to not print our proposals on, all that kind of stuff. So I think this is a big conversation. And for me, it's just an opportunity to take the choices that I make in my personal life into the business sphere to kind of expand that voting with my dollars thing like that you might do when you buy an organic thing over a not organic or you turn down the plastic bag for the cloth bag. It's just a bigger platform and opportunity to take those um, lifestyle approaches bigger. Um, so to me, it, it's going to look different for every business because every business has a different place, has a different owner. Every owner has a different set of values that they are going to focus on, which will be different than somebody else's values. You have different clients. You have different climates. So um, I just want everyone to think about the choices they're making and try to do better. And so we're not here to like judge you for the choices that you make or the things that you do, but just ask like, hey, could you do that a little differently, do a little better to have a really positive impact on the world, on yourself, on your family, on your workers, um, and to create better businesses and lives for the people that we interact with all the time. Um, so we know that local matters, but we're going to take it a step farther. So, so the reason that we are looking at these things is for environmental concerns. Floristry actually is a pretty dirty, dirty business, right? There's so much packaging. It starts with all the horticulture practice or plastics, right, that are used in farming, which, you know, are tricky. And then it goes into, like, we're wrapping things, we're shipping them, um, there's a lot of single-use plastic in our industry that turns into trash. There's a lot of, um, like, foam, and when you soak the foam, it goes into the waterways. So we're impacting landfills, we're impacting waterways, we're impacting um, the farming of plants, impacts the pesticides and the runoff of fertilizers. There's so many things to think about in our floristry, big, huge 
industry, how you can insert yourself to make an improvement in even one of those small places is, you know, a better than moment. Like Carly was saying, deforestation for cropland and um, how that works, and then the carbon footprint of all the transporting. And so as a, um, you know, for me, part of my business sustainability is making a living for myself. I have two teenage boys, one of whom is a huge runner, and that dude never stops eating, and he's really picky about food, and he's expensive to feed, so I have to make money Whenever anybody would hire me to do something, I have to do it. So I have a commitment to sourcing local, but if I get a job in January in Seattle and they want more than like cedar and sword fern, part of my sustainability is to say yes and to make income for my family. And so, you know, that bride, we're going to call her a bride, might want roses and while I may say like, oh, well, we've got these awesome locally grown hothouse amaryllis to consider instead, if she's bent on roses, part of it for me with my business model of sustainability is to say like, I will get you roses, but I'm gonna look for a certified sustainable grown sort of rose so that it is coming from a place where they are also thinking about these things. And so um, if you need to, do things that are beyond local, there are ways that you can do it in still a better than way. And so I just ask you to be aware of that. Ask for that at your wholesaler. Um, try to help make some of these things happen. I think particularly when we're talking about bigger than small local farming, but still with local farming, we have all these social considerations, like how are people getting paid? And do they have, what are their treatments like? Um, what are the working conditions like? Are they safe, you know? Are, are we sourcing from places where child labor is still a thing? Are workers having safety protections? And what are the provisions for childcare? So many workers in the floriculture industry overseas are women. And so there's preserving that viability for women and the family structure that goes along with it, that if you're not sourcing locally and you're going bigger, again, these certified sustainable operations, they have regulations for all these things, so you can still feel good. Like, I'm not trying to go away from local because everyone, that's our first and foremost goal, but it just isn't always practical. So I think it's good to acknowledge that there's these better than choices that preserve these options. And then again, going back to a real sustainable business is one that's making happy clients, right? Because then you can stay in business and you then have the opportunity to keep promoting your own messages and values and keep investing in the things that you think are bringing betterment to the world. Um, Part of business sustainability also is pricing. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about pricing today, but I'm happy to answer questions because pricing is so variable based on your market. And so I don't believe actually in this like industry formula that works for everyone because your markets are so different and your business models are so different. But I do think to remember like even if this is something you love, you should get paid for it and you should have a sustainable living coming from your passion. And so I hear people saying like, oh, it's okay. I like it, what I'm doing, so it doesn't matter. Like, I want to argue that. It does matter. Make yourself a living, you know. Um, and we have to remember what is feasible when we're doing things. And so for me, to have a feasible business, it might mean sourcing from a broader pool. Like, I try to stay in America, but in Seattle, in for a January wedding, you can bet I'm on the phone to California to get stock and things like that. Like, I just have to. So, um, and then consider your decisions beyond your floral and your mechanics in your businesses. Like, for your business bathroom, get 100% recycled or, um, you know, yeah, it's recycled fiber or toilet paper. And instead of using paraffin candles, get like a palm oil or a certified sustainable palm or soy-based candle so that you're not using a petroleum product. So there's lots of ways that we can think about the sustainability of our businesses beyond just our flowers and our mechanics. Um, but now I'm gonna dive into the meat of it, which is the mechanics. So um, I have a commitment to working foam-free in my practice. 
Um, foam is a single-use plastic. It's a micro, it becomes a microplastic when it breaks apart. It is not certified compostable. So um, there's some controversy be behind foam, and I'm not going to linger there. But I try to stay with, um, well, I'm fully 100% committed to that. I live in an area where that's feasible. Um, anyway, so today what I will talk about is doing installations without foam. However, I think a lot of the things that we need to think about when we think about doing floral installations, it doesn't matter whether your water source becomes foam or not, like there's a lot more things to think about. So um, your mechanics, what are you using to attach, to hold up, to hang, to stand, to rig? We need to think about um, where we are making, what we are making, how much time do we have to make them? Um, it's really important that you do a site visit so that you know what the site offers. And then also that you know things like, how much time do I have to set up? When do I need to be ready? When are they taking pictures in front of this or whatever? How much time do I have to take down at the end of the night? Am I taking it down? Is someone else taking it down? Am I going to get my stuff back? Um, as a as an event florist, most of the time, I'm getting my stuff back at the end of the night, and I'm doing it. So I am not just like whisking everything off to the dumpster. I'm like loading it in my van. I'm taking it back to the studio. I'm unprocessing. And so I can use some mechanics that aren't exactly disposable, because that's part of my business goal, is to build with things that I can reuse and reclaim again and again and again. And so I have. Um, chicken wire still that I'm using now from, like I still have the first few sausage rolls that we did for the Whidbey workshop in 2017. I fully have last year's chicken wire. Like I just keep using the same chunks. And it's pretty nice to know like, oh, I've already got that weird set of like sticks wrapped in wire that are six feet tall. Like, cause I pulled all this stuff out of them and threw them in my husband's hated corner. And you know, like, anyway. so. Um, as you are designing, you need to know the limitations of your space because you need to design around the limitations, but those limitations then become your opportunity, right? And so then that becomes part of what will inspire your creativity and what will inspire your design. Um, so yeah, also like the materials that you choose. So I want to give a shout out to Cut Flower Scott and his flower podcast. If you don't tune in, you should. Um, and so Scott had Sue McCleary on the other day, and um, she's got this list of reliables of plants that are great out of water for a while. And so if you sign up for this, the, the Flowers podcast, then you can get Sue's list of reliable materials, which is great. So choose things that are sturdy, that are du durable, that will hold up, process them well. Allow time for thorough hydration of your materials. Cut and recut. Let things plump up and be turgid. Make sure that they're really at their peak. When you're shopping, shop well. Squeeze, touch, make sure that stuff is like not about to go because there's nothing that will push it over faster than a few hours in the sun with no water or limited water. Um, and that's true of however you're going to design your stuff, right? Like this is a demanding profession that we're in event floristry. Things have to be on and they have to be perfect. So um, if you are in doubt about how to process something, find somebody that knows and ask them. And then think about your water sources. And these will vary whether you're indoors or outdoors, what you can do. Like indoors, it's a little scarier to hang buckets over people's heads. Outdoors, like no problem, whatever. I mean, you don't want to give the bride a surprise bath. But if it goes on to grass, it's less of a deal. Um, and then make sure that things are structural. I also want to say, if you're doing installations, make sure that you have business insurance. Get your liability insurance, be paid up, be legit, because um, you just don't want that on your head. I strongly recommend that. And if you are asking yourself, like, oh, should I be doing this? Is this too big for me? Like, the answer might well be yes. There are professional rigging companies, often found with lighting companies, and they can rig the structures for you. That takes the liability onto them take stress off of you. And so that can make a lot of sense. And especially if you have time considerations, that can be a great way to um, help 
buy you some time to have them get started with that. So um, we talked a little bit about choosing your plant materials. So mostly what we have today are things that are pretty reliable. Um, and we'll talk about that more as we make the installation. Um, definitely build for stability, over-engineer, think about wind, think about um, people bumping into things, think about clearance and traffic and use and like, is somebody going to trip on this? Um, yeah, think about those things. Think about when I hang these, when I put the water into this, um, it, how is it going to shift? Think about balance. Like, is it going to be stable? You want to make sure that you're building something that, like, can stand, right? Um, and then design for impact, because why not? You want to make an impact. Um, so think about, like, groupings and how you put things together. And, you know, like, if I'm designing a wedding arbor, um, things with big faces, things with light colors, they come at you, they're easily seen, um, that makes for a strong design impact. The things that I use in my practice for, for, for floral supports, branches a lot, I'm kind of a stick hoarder. Um, chicken wire for sure, all the time. I'm big into the chicken wire. My favorite is made by Oasis and it is not the painted stuff, it's plastic coated and it is what we got today. Thank you, Christine, for getting the right thing. Um, so have a look at it because it doesn't chip and flake, which drives me crazy, because then I'm, chip, I'm sweeping paint chips and putting them in my compost, I hate that. And it allows me to use it again and again and again and again and again. It's easy on stems when you jab it in, it's less likely to shred them. And then when you have it in water, it's not rusting or making creepy like solutions in your vase, which has to do with vase life. Um, do you all know the holly pillows from Syndicate Sales? You'll get to play with them today. We have some. They come in two pieces, and then they have like a little female and a little male part, and you just twist them until they go together. And these are great for like elevated centerpieces. You can put them on a bucket. You design into them. Because they have this 2D matrix, things stay where you put them. They don't like, you know, they, they don't like flap out again. Um, and then you can set them on a bucket and have things in water and then either lift them up, cut them flush, and hang them up. Like that's a way you can make in advance. Because a lot of this I hear is, if I don't use foam, I can't make stuff in advance. Well, this is a mechanic. And you could do the same thing with the wad of chicken wire. But this is a mechanic that would allow you to do that, or a wad of branches. Um, and then these also can go on top of a lot of vases. So you can take, keep your elevated centerpieces in their boxes, nice and clean in the truck, and then you transport these low on a bucket. And then when you get to the venue, you can put it up high. Um, pretty nifty. Um, so I use holly pillows a lot. Wire is good, of course. Zip ties. Um, if you don't know Jack Lily Floral on Instagram, check her out. Go back a few posts. She's got um, a reusable zip tie that's awesome. It's releasable, so you don't have to throw away your plastic zip ties anymore. Yeah, pretty rad. Um, and then the other tip that I'm going to give you that if you do installations a lot, this is worth the price of admission right here. You know that shelf liner, which is a plastic product, but it doesn't have to be single use, that's like kind of foamy, sticky, bubbly sort of thing? If you have to strap stuff onto a post and it slides down, and you hate that it slides down, get some uh, shelf liner. And then you can zip onto that, and that stuff just stays right there. So all those like tent tie backs with the huge, heavy swaths of stuff, like that's how you get it around the pole to stay tight. Anyway, tips. <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, so I call this the moss roulade, and I made one for you to palpate, but as Carly said, she's a sheddy Betty, so we're not going to pass her around, but I'll have it on the back. But this is a great thing. I use this for a lot of, like, arbor sprays, and this is also a really great make-ahead piece. So you lay your chicken wire flat, you get out your moss, the real stuff, not like the decorative business. Um, you lay it down, you roll it up, you lay it down, you roll it up, think about cinnamon rolls, think about like the roulade cakes. Then you mash it into the shapes that you want and then <clears throat> you can soak it and pull it up and design into it. 
this moist moss provides so much humidity so that when you get the flowers up in it, like they have all this nice humidity there and they stay fresher for longer, you know. Um, you can jab the stem through it and put a test tube on the other side so you can tube the flowers. You can design, you can get like those, um, you know, like a storage tote, carry tote things that maybe are a little shallow. And you can put it on that thing and then you can put design into it. And then you can do it like the day or two before and it can just be sitting on those so the flowers are going through into the water. And they're all mostly designed. I put the zip ties through at the very beginning. And then you can tie them onto the, strap them onto the, you know, your arbor or what have you. So you don't need to have water, but you've got a humidity source for your flowers. If you cut short enough, they can be in the, the moss and things like roses and lilies and lisianthus and stuff that's pretty tough often will get enough moisture from that. But again, that's like, what's your climate? What's your bloom? How did you process it? What's the day like? Is this like a three o'clock in the afternoon? in August in Phoenix, like you might want to have water tubes on the backside of this sucker. Um, but I find this to be uber reusable and super um, friendly and it's easy like if the person wants to repurpose, you cut the ties, you take it and you put it up in the next place in the venue, like it's pretty handy mechanic. Um, test tubes, I use a bunch, I don't feel like I need to show them off. And then EcoFresh wraps, has anybody used EcoFresh wraps before? Um, there are, a sponsor, a contributing sponsor? sponsor there's something like that. Yeah, so you've got samples in your bag and then there's a bunch that we'll use and if anybody wants to see, so like, who has not made an EcoFresh wrap? Okay, enough people. So we'll do a super quick demo. They come like a little, I don't know, chevron shape. This is a dry one. So you would soak it. You can cut them into usable size pieces, but you take your flowers, which Callas don't really need water, but whatever. So you take your flowers, you put them in, you tuck them in, and you wrap, and you wrap, and then you band, or not, that you put them, then a bag goes over it. So there's been, this is like long-winded, I won't make it long-winded, but here it comes in the plastic bag, like, yeah, that's a problem. But um, compostable plastics, it's all controversial. So, but this does need something to hold it, because um, it's wet and it's dripping, but you, you strap it on and then I will do another closure around the bag with the thing and oftentimes I'll do the closure as I attach. You can wrap it in a leaf, you can wrap it in a moss to make it disappear. But anyway, this is EcoFresh. I use this a ton in my installations. Um, we are gonna see more of it in just a minute. I'm gonna blast through here. Oh, there's the holly pillows which I just showed you. Um, yeah, there's all the water sources. Gorilla containers to me is like, um, do you know those graveyard steak things? They're like a, a green plastic on a stick. I'll shove a piece of chicken wire in there, strap them over the top. You can strap them onto branches, poles, posts. People are making hydration towers now. Like, I don't know if you followed Sue McCleary. She recently had a post on one that she had welded, but maybe you don't have time or bandwidth to do that. Like, you can just use sticks. You can use old yogurt tubs you know, wrap leaves around them, spray paint them, whatever, like poke holes in them, zip tie them on there. But consider that you can use, get the vases that come with the little hangers and you can tuck them in and hang them around. Um, there's ways to do it. It just requires like playing around, thinking outside the box, a little bit of innovation. There's Carly, yay, um, at a Woodby Flower Workshop. She's holding an EcoFresh wrap that's done. So you see it in its bag, you see it with water in there. It's a big old bunch that we were putting in to a thing that you'll see soon. So here's some of those techniques in application. Um, so this is a piece we made at, uh, so I produce a workshop called the Whidbey Flower Workshop that's dedicated to teaching people to use, to make cool stuff without foam. Um, so this was this huge, we did this with Joseph Massey, huge, I'm in it for scale piece. And there is what I call the secret bucket. So inside that urn on the table is a bucket of water. And then there's rigging lines up on the ceiling and then big tubes of chicken wire basically that we jabbed dry stems in, but then also eco-fresh wraps. Some stuff was tubed. But from that huge installation, we had this bucket 
afterwards that also has test tubes in it still that I then pull out the test tubes. Um, so pretty good in the way of like garbage from that giant thing. And I don't even think with me in that picture for scale, I still don't think you get the scale of it. It was massive. Um, this piece is again like rigged to the ceiling. This has a bucket in the bottom of it. So, and we'll do this with the installation today. So there's a big five gallon bucket in the bottom of that. And then there's this like chicken wire like tube that goes up it. We rolled compost literally, um, like branch clippings and swaggy bits that weren't any good, you know, and we rolled that all up in there so that when you stab through the chicken wire, there's stuff inside for the branches to catch into. Um, so that went up and then over, and um, that has EcoFresh wraps in it and test tubes and some dry insertions, and we made it that morning, and it looked good all night, and it sure was fun. That was with Sue McCleary. Um, this was from this year's would be workshop. So that um, piece is dry insertions. Um, it was a metal frame, which was our structure, lots of branches. We had some things tubed. Um, we had the cherry was in EcoFresh, and then we had a lot of dry, dry insertion stuff. That just means branches out of water around it to kind of help camouflage. So lots of different types of mechanics all into one big piece. Um, this is, um, so this is I, the secret bucket. So this is a super DIY, you don't need a welder. So that's a trash can from, I don't know, wherever trash cans come from, like a little office kind of can in um, an accent decor urn that then has concrete on the bottom and some tomato steaks, right? And then chicken wire around it, and then a bucket that slides down until it stops sliding, basically. And then if I'm going to put... Um, a lot of really heavy woody stuff in that top bucket. I might give it some extra hugs of like wire really tight so that it can't keep sliding down and by the end of the night it looks real different than it did the first <laughs> night. But those, they're like, I think they're one inch stakes. Anyway, this, it's just all about the MacGyvering and the like self-engineering. And so this homely thing is the innards of that big cool thing. <laughs> which also then had like some chicken wire extenders up in it to get it up high over that very tall doorway. Um, yeah, it's about messing around. Um, that's all chicken wire. There's some holly pillows in there. Um, I wish I had a little laser pointer. Does it do it? it might oh, it might. So like there's, there's chicken wire that goes here, but then we put some holly pillows like in here and in here to kind of beef out where we wanted some more beefing. Um, yep. That is just holly pillow. So there's a wire ring and we strapped a bunch of branches on and then there's like probably three holly pillows connected and then one or two and then just dry insertion that was tucked away. We knew like it needed to look good for like two hours. So um, we could just cheat and do it dry. But again, that's like knowing the timeline, knowing the event, knowing that they had this whole other place where pictures were going to happen, and really that was about the magic of the ceremony and didn't have to go much longer. Those were probably the big ones, but, um, you know, adapt to the scale. She's got uh, several sizes, so adapt to the size. And I just zip tie them together, you know, so they're like this, right? I mean, they're whole, but yeah, it's pretty... Pretty nifty. Um, this is a brilliant idea by Christine Hoffman that I was thinking we were going to work into the installation that we didn't, but she does this as a loom. So she's got sticks here, and then you, I don't know, I hope you can see there's twine that goes in between, and then the flowers get woven in the twine. That would be a great one where if you weren't coming back to take it down, because that whole thing could then be compost, right? Like there's nothing in it that isn't compostable. Um, and then here's, this is a lot of what we're doing today. So this is Carly at um, one of her presentations. So the wooden frame with the chicken moss. And then this arch was made just by the branches and like the natural um, character of the branches. And that's one of the beautiful things that foraging can bring to your work is like this, the real spirit of nature, uncultivated nature, untamed nature. Like, this is pretty produced nature, which is still gorgeous, but then that real spirit of the wild in there um, 
is the extra kiss of magic. So anyway, we're going to incorporate some of these techniques in what we're doing today. Um, this is another one that we did, really super similar. So there's, I, you can almost still see the bucket. So there's the bucket with lots of chicken wire. There was like a holly pillow right there. I think there was another holly pillow or two in there. And there was tons of EcoFresh in that and some, um, oh yeah, we probably had a moss roulade because I just sort of throw everything on when I'm teaching. Like here's all the things, play with them, see what it feels like. So um, there you go. That was a big collaborative piece. And there's a lot more to it than that. So um, I have, that's my website. I'm teaching, Becky, where are you, Becky, wave. Becky's producing a workshop in Calgary in September on sustainable installations and other cool sustainable forestry topics. Um, there's the Woodby Flower Workshop, and I announce stuff by my mailing list. So that's how you know. But um, I will take questions, and I'm also going to walk through and do a quick like if you can just kind of rotate. At lunch, um, we are going to make stuff. Karen, what time is it? It's 11, 12. 11, 12, it's perfect, perfect, okay. So um, at lunch, we invite you to come play. So we have this structure back here that incorporates several techniques and it's just gonna be an awesome collaborative free for all that, um, of funness that we'll just make, and it'll get crazy and wild and good. And so you can practice some of these techniques, see how it feels, ask me questions. I think all the instructors are gonna kind of be in and out of helping. But while I make my way there, does anybody have questions? Speak it loud and clear. What's your favorite way to cut wire? My favorite way to cut chicken wire is with tin snips. And we have a huge pair of tin snips here, but you can get small scissor-sized ones. But I strongly recommend, it's the right tool to the right job. Don't use your pruners because it kills them. And get something that's meant for the job because it saves your hand. So yeah, tin snips for chicken wire. Any more questions? No more questions? Okay, so we've got this fun situation back here. Um, so we have... They're, um, they're hinged frames, so you could collapse them and fold them flat at the end of your event. This is a Christine Huffman and her husband design. Um, so these give you a nice sturdy framework. They've got a cool, it's worth coming before we green it up, a cool way with hinges, and I guess it's the pin of the hinge that connects the two piece, so the floor stabilizing piece, and then this framework piece that holds them open to keep them from splaying and going wider and falling over either direction and gives it some sturdiness. So that's a super ingenious, portable, repeatable, deliverable um, design, which is great. Easily stored in your studio because it's flat. It doesn't have to store occupying many 3Ds. Um, we have wrapped the frame with chicken wire. It's got two dimensions, so there's space in between. So what I will do, I don't know why I just put it down. Um, so, you know, we'll stab, stab, stab stuff through, but you'll also take your EcoFresh, which will be in bags with water, and you can work them in between the layers of chicken wire. If if there's not an opening between, because we did like this, right, with the roll of chicken wire, does that make sense? So there's pockets where each layer is. You can close them up when you're done to give stability. You can like zip tie them or bind wire them together. You can cut holes in here if it's not, if the hole isn't where you want to put something, you just cut yourself a pocket and you jam it in. And then you put greenery around it. You can use sticks of other greenery underneath to like then rest your EcoFresh on. I mean, these are all like highly technical skills, people. It's really hard. It really takes years and years and years of practice. As Carly and I were doing this, we're like, this feels kind of like we're just like screwing around here. Like, do we really know what we're doing? We're going to stand up and talk about this. But really, you just slap some chicken wire onto some pieces of wood that stand up, and you're ready to go, right? <laughs> um, so we have branches tied on. We have what will become the secret bucket. So it's a bucket. I like black buckets because it's easier to make them secret with some chicken wire in it for the matrix inside and then chicken wire around it. Um, we don't totally have the product match of the, for the bucket today, but the, bucket, the secret bucket method is awesome if you have like 
big flowering branches that you want to use that, or anything that's really water hungry because you have unlimited water and it can hold a lot, right? You can put like a concrete block or rocks or whatever in there, sand to hold it in. And then you have this big, huge water source that you can really start everything from. And then you cover it with chicken wire so that you disguise that bucket and it goes all the way down. Does that make sense? Um, Here's a holly pillow. We have many for you to play with, and you can strap them on wherever you want. You can make, um, you can make things get really 3D that way. So you can build out, you know, if you wanted to give this thing a big boob or whatever, you, you could. Um, and then we have this little, like, stick leg wad on the ground that will just be the flowing greenery piece. So um, it's going to evolve, but it's layers of techniques. So we can tube stuff. Today, in this air conditioning, with the materials we have, the water, and for the time that we need this, right, like it's going to last six hours, it's almost overkill for us to water source a lot of what we have. For the most part, none of this stuff will really need it, but I think we should do it for practicing and learning, and so you get comfortable with the techniques while there's people to ask, like, hey, am I doing this right? And to get a feel for it if you haven't done it yet. Thank you so much, Toby and yeah. Carly. This was an amazing presentation. So I think uh, I would invite you all to check out what Toby and Carly are doing with this amazing installation. Get your hands on it and or grab some food and then go back and help them. Does that make sense? Great. And then um, Lisa is uh, going to help manage the book table and the, the few Slow Flowers t-shirts that we have. So you can go visit her too and meet the speaker.